Hello, good morning. Today our guest is Dr. Charles Butcher. Hello, Dr. Charles Butcher. How are you doing? Good, good. Thank you. Thank you for having me uh, on. So we're going to be talking about international re relations in the non-Western world. And the title of your article is War, Interaction Capacity, and the Structures of State Systems. What is interaction capacity? Uh, okay. <clears throat> so in the... Uh... In the article, the way that we're thinking about interaction capacity is how basically how easy it is to transport um, uh, goods, um, uh, people, uh, ideas, um, essentially the speed with which um, uh, those aspects uh, can be moved. And the density is also correlated with the level of interaction capacity. So define a low density state. Yeah, okay, so, so, so a low density system would be one where it's generally very expensive to move uh, goods uh, and uh, move ideas and people uh, across space. And there are several reasons why um, why that can be expensive. So one is, and, and this characterizes, um, uh, this characterizes international relations sort of right up to the industrial revolution um, is it's just generally very slow to move these things. Uh, people were limited for a long time, um, uh, essentially to how fast uh, animals uh, or, or people could uh, travel of their own energy. Um, uh, so that is a sort of a basic limitation on the ability to transport, uh, as I say, goods uh, and ideas and so on. Um, uh, but another way, another way in which uh, um, we can think about systems being low density is is related to how sparsely populated they are too. So, um, so if you want to sell a good, uh, for example, and uh, you have to transport that good a certain distance. Well, how many potential buyers you have on the other end, uh, on the other end of that uh, link, is going to sort of um, determine how much money you can make off transporting that good. And the fewer people there are, the fewer consumers there are, the relatively more expensive it becomes uh, to transport those those items. So, so lower density systems are generally those in which it's 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 slow uh, and expensive. Uh, to transport uh, goods and, and, and ideas and so on. And in your article, you compared two different systems, the Oyo Empire and the Mysuru Empire in South Asia. Was the Oyo Empire a low density state and why? So I, I, um, I was also very happy to listen to one of your uh, your recent um, YouTube episodes uh, on the Oyo Empire, which was which was really very interesting. Um, so, so the the short answer is, is yes. So, so when I when we take a comparative perspective across these different international systems, there are several um, aspects which uh, or several variables that we think suggest that in again speaking quite generally, West Africa was a fairly low. Uh, density type of system uh, at the time, which put fairly heavy constraints on on the extent to which uh, states could centralize their power. So, um, uh, as I mentioned before, generally speaking, transport was quite slow uh, in West Africa. It was very efficient for the conditions, of course. I mean, this was a very, very well tailored transport system to the conditions. Um, um, but at the same time, uh, uh, transport was basically limited to how far people or uh, or animals could travel in a day. And depending a little bit upon the ecological zones that we're talking about, um, uh, the sort of the, also the bulk of goods that could be carried was generally, uh, generally quite low. Um, and then at the same time, I mean, this doesn't, <laughs> Southwestern Nigeria itself was probably relatively densely populated, um, at least compared to other parts of, of West Africa. But when we start to move a little bit further north in, uh, uh, and we're talking about relatively low population densities. Um, um, so, so this kind of fits the conditions of 
uh, of being a low density system. It was expensive uh, to transport particularly bulk goods. And so a lot of the trade that occurred tended to be in higher value goods, uh, gold, carry shells, and so on. Um, and, and what we basically argue in the, in the paper is that this puts a break on the ability of states to, to centralize. So even if states do want to, let's say, extract resources directly from their subordinate uh, polities, um, uh, this, this, the, how, the, these high costs to projecting power uh, mean that it's, it's, uh, it's very difficult to do so. And so most, most of the states that we see in these low density systems uh, are quite decentralized in the sense that they, um, they don't directly control subordinate polities or kingdoms. They allow them a lot of autonomy. They allow them generally autonomy to extract resources in the way they want, to administer their own judicial systems um, uh, and so on, often with some kind of transfer of resources uh, in exchange. And Mysore, how would you describe that state? Yeah, so it's it's a really interesting uh, case study, and so uh, just a, a, a short caveat. So when when I describe um, these two systems or these two states, uh, I'm relying heavily upon the existing historical literature. So I'm not myself a historian, uh, and um, uh, I more or less trust uh, what uh, academic historians have to say about these places. So there's, a, there's an interesting discussion about uh, South India in the, in the late 18th and uh, early 19th century, which suggests that it was undergoing a kind of proto-industrialization, which means that, um, so, so even though transport, the ability to transport goods was still relatively slow. Uh, so still basically limited by uh, the distances that uh, people or animals could travel on foot. Um, it was much more densely populated. Uh, and uh, not only was it much more densely populated, but there were um, uh, fairly highly developed uh, manufacturing industries that were uh, that were emerging in the south in the south of India, uh, denser trade networks uh, also uh, in in the region, and so this kind of our argument anyway is is that this. Uh, this, this increases the incentives of states to directly extract resources from themselves, for themselves. So there are, there are sort of upsides and downsides to these, these two slightly different ways of ruling that we, that we discussed. So in the more decentralized way of ruling, uh, it, again, it, it's, it's, it's efficient from the perspective of rulers in low density systems because it doesn't cost much to implement, right? You demand that a certain amount of resources be transferred, uh, to the center, um, but you don't have to pay the full cost of actually paying your own um, uh, state agents to go and directly extract taxes for themselves. It might involve, it often involves, uh, taxation often involves some resistance and rebellion that is of course expensive also to put down. So it's very efficient in that sense. Um, but the, uh, the downside of it is, is that uh, local rulers and tax collectors have a lot more information about what production levels actually are locally, and they will use that information uh, to, to give as little as they possibly can back to the center. I think we see lots of examples uh, of this. And so the advantages of, the, of more centralized rule are for the center anyway, that it doesn't, um, uh, it, it, uh, it can extract the resources directly so there are opportunities for local agents to kind of uh, cream off or manipulate inf uh, poor information for their own benefit is lower. But of course, it's very expensive. Uh, you have to pay a lot of upfront costs to establish a kind of infrastructure of rule in a, in a, in a local area. So in, in South, at least the, as far as I read the historical literature, South India was a, a high, this kind of higher density system. There was more people, there was a higher intensity of trade. Um, and basically this, uh, the idea is, is that this begins to offset some of those 
uh, costs of establishing uh, direct rule. So basically, you can, uh, it's more valuable now to control those parts of the territory, and that can offset some of the costs that, we, that have to be paid. Uh, and so our prediction is basically, it's in these types of systems uh, that you, and you start to see more centralized forms of rule. And I think we do see that in, in, in Mysore just before uh, the British colonized uh, uh, the, that part of India in about 1799. I, I think that's what we see. This was a quite unusually centralized uh, state in India. So are you saying that state centralization is driven by density? So this is a really, really interesting question. And, um, and, and I, so our, our thinking of course has, has evolved uh, on this question even after the publication of the article that we're discussing today. And so the answer I think is yes and no. And so the, the yes part of the answer is, is that I do think that when it's very expensive to, tra to, 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 to transport things and, and therefore very expensive to directly rule um, um, uh, territories or subordinate polities, I, I think that is a, a basic explanation for why centralized states were not very common prior to the Industrial Revolution. This, uh, I think this helps us to understand why indirect forms of rule were extremely common uh, and across multiple different uh, regions that were unconnected. So we see, for example, very, very similar state structures uh, in, in these basic terms that I'm talking about, whether it's centralized or decentralized, we see very, very similar strategies of rule in, uh, in West Africa, in, in South Asia, in Southeast Asia, um, for example. So I think that this, this difficulty of, of transporting uh, goods and ideas uh, puts a break on the ability of states to centralize and, and, and basically makes them prefer these more decentralized uh, forms of rule. So. But does it follow then that uh, as states become, uh, or, or sorry, as, as um, systems or regions become uh, denser in the sense that they have uh, more people, perhaps more trade, uh, it becomes easier to transport uh, goods and ideas. Uh, um, does that then necessarily mean that uh, centralized, centralization will happen? And I think the answer is sometimes. <laughs> Um, uh, it's certainly not a necessary, it's, it certainly doesn't follow in a direct and linear way. So one of the, one of the triggering variables that we talk about in the paper is international competition. So it, so basically inter international competition can uh, stimulate centralization by undermining the bargaining power of subordinate polities, making it easier for the center to, to get what they want in these higher density systems, which is more direct forms uh, of extraction. But there are lots of examples where we have growing or relatively high population density and states, then, and we don't see centralized states emerging. And uh, the, 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 I think the Yoruba polities of, of West Africa are, are, are a good example. Um, I mean, we have some, we have the Dahomey Empire, which is much more centralized and uh, uh, the Ashanti Empire that was much more centralized, but even in the highest density, uh, uh, sort of the highest density parts of West Africa, we have a real diversity of state forms um, uh, from extremely decentralized, uh, um, or, or I wouldn't necessarily say stateless, but, but extremely decentralized regions to uh, larger empires, uh, to, to what we might think of as, as city states and, and other sort of decentralized states. And we also see something similar in, in Southeast Asia too. So the, you know, the highest, uh, the areas of Southeast Asia prior to the, prior to the uh, 19th century with the highest population density. So in Java and in Bali, for example, Again, we don't really see the rise of centralized states here. So I think it's a combination of things. I think this, I think um, rising, let's say interaction capacity or dynamic density creates the foundations that make state centralization possible. But to, to then activate that potential requires something else. A war is po possibly one of those factors, but I also suspect there are, there are many others. 
how is the economy affected by centralization? Are centralized state, states more likely to impose taxes and extract resources? Yeah, so that and that, that's more or less how we define centralization. So when we are thinking about centralization in the paper, we're really thinking about fiscal centralization. And that's the and that's the movement from a situation where, like if we imagine that we have a, a center and a periphery and they're bargaining together over resources. Centralization, the way that we're thinking about it is, is the movement from one there's one situation to another, which I'll describe. So so decentralization is where the subordinate polity controls how resources are ex extracted. It uses its own agents, uh, it uses its own methods to extract resources, and then transfers some proportion of those to the center. Now, again, this is a very, very common way of structuring states, um, uh, prior, roughly speaking, prior to the, to the 19th to 20th century. Now, centralization is when uh, the center says, okay, no, we don't want you to extract uh, the resources yourself. We're going to go in and extract them ourselves. And so that involves the creation of uh, bureaucracy, of uh, 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 agents of the state, uh, usually paid and salaried by the state to directly collect taxes or assess the tax base uh, to collect taxes for themselves and uh, and um, uh, get rid of that intermediary layer between collection and transfer to the center. So yes, is that, is that, that's sort of how we define centralization in the paper. And is the nature of warfare different in <laughs> centralized states? Mm. Again, I, I really, really think that's a, um, a good question and something that I, I, need a, I need a moment to think, think a wee bit about. Um, so I don't, so the, I, I guess the starting, one thing I might say, I don't think the goals of warfare are, are necessarily different. Um, I think there has been maybe this view out there that, that uh, warfare in the pre-modern age was more about raiding and marauding uh, than it was about goals that we might consider to be more germane to international relations, like territorial conquest, um, overthrowing leaders that are, uh, that are, are not inimic uh, sorry, that are inimical to a state's uh, interest. Uh, I don't think those goals have changed. I think we see quite a bit of consistency in the goals that rulers pursue with warfare. What, what centralized states probably do that's different uh, in, in uh, the conduct of warfare is they're probably, and I'm speculating a little bit here, but they're, they're probably able to construct larger standing armies. They're probably able to uh, afford uh, more sophisticated weaponry if it's available. So my guess is that as states centralize, warfare becomes um, more destructive. Um, um, but you know, this can 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 also this can also sometimes go the other way uh, around too. So my guess is that um, probably warfare becomes uh, on a larger scale and more destructive as states as states centralize. Yes, I, I just had to ask that question because when I was reading your paper, I saw a, a part on warfare in low density societies. So I just had yeah. to pose that question. Oh, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, to be just... Uh, um, uh, <sighs> I, I think there's very much that's familiar about warfare in, in lower density societies. I mean, one thing that is probably quite different is that instead of being able to call upon a standing army, uh, and, and so if we, if we want to think now about Europe, but there are also, of course, standing armies in, in, in Africa, South Asia, and Southeast Asia too. Uh, but if we want to think for a minute about uh, European states with standing armies, 
So the ruler can call upon a standing army to conduct uh, to conduct warfare. It's a little bit different in lower in more decentralized states because what was often the case is that uh, either the center had a very small uh, armed force um, or it didn't have an armed force at all. And in order to conduct warfare, um, negotiations had to happen with subordinate polities. It had to had to mobilize uh, from um, uh, from those polities that were a, a part of it in order to conduct warfare, um, because um, military force was mobilized at a very local level. Uh, so there was a, a sort of a, an inherently dispersed aspect of of uh, decision-making in warfare, I think, in these more decentralized states. International competition, is it really good for states? Oh. No. <laughs> is it really good? So, okay. So I think, again, this is a really interesting a, a debate and discussion. And, and, and as I think we talk about in the paper, uh, <laughs> I'm increasingly skeptical of this idea that um, uh, that that war creates states. And just to be really, really clear, I also uh, so people will often say Charles Tilly said that war states make war and um, and uh, war makes uh, states. I mean, his his theory on this was much, much more nuanced. Um, and so I, I'm I'm not I don't want to sort of construct a, a straw man. Um, but one of the things that we point out in the article, and I think I've, I've noticed in, in further study, is that there are many, many conditions under which war does not make states. Um, and, and in fact, even the op opposite, war can be a, 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 a means through which states disintegrate. And there's several reasons for this, so, and that relate to the point that I, I just made. So if um, if competition increases and it becomes the let's say the international the, the the system that surrounds a particular state becomes more competitive, it becomes more threatening. It becomes more important to mobilize uh, or to have uh, armed force capable of defending uh, defending territory or uh, or fighting war. So who does this actually empower? Well, it actually empowers the subordinate polities because the center is dependent upon them to mobilize. Uh, armed force. And so in our paper, we point out that, that, that uh, polities that are retain a lot of autonomy, but are still part of a, a state, they, they always have incentives to maintain that autonomy. And if warfare empowers those subordinate polities uh, in their bargaining position against the center, well, then they're going to use that to, uh, to, to demand or at least preserve the autonomy that they have. And I think we also see this it, when we talk about modern wars. So when we talk about the, the rise of, of, or the role of say the first world war uh, in driving women's enfranchisement, uh, the same argument is made. Um, uh, st states became dependent upon their populations to, to manufacture uh, armaments to serve in the army. And in return, people demanded decentralization of power back in this case, in the form of suffrage and, and, and democratization. So, so that's the first point. And then the second point is, is that, okay, so there is this argument kind of floating around out there that, 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 um, that com increased competition makes leaders want more revenue. They need more revenue to pay bigger, more sophisticated armies on a more permanent basis. But I think the problem with that argument is, is that, uh, it doesn't help us understand why leaders aren't already extracting as much revenue as they can. And I, and I think there are strong incentives for leaders to do this because they don't just face external threats, uh, they also face internal threats. And the best way to combat internal threats is to extract as much revenue as you can and keep your coalition intact. Um, so I think the way that my thinking is evolving on, on this is that uh, competition probably only positively contributes to state building in a in a handful of really specific situations, and there are situations. And I, my guess is that there are situations in which um, uh, the situations in which um, um, competition undermines the bargaining position of or autonomous parts 
of the state. And there are maybe, there's some reasons why this might be the case, for example, the rise of nationalism. So if being conquered by another state might entail the uh, extinguishing of a, of a subordinate uh, a polity, then that subordinate polity might have incentives to accept increased centralization in order to, in order to survive as a community. Um, so, but I, I think those circumstances are, are probably uh, not so many. And in, and in general, I think competition has been something that has driven, oh, I suspect anyway, I, I, I'm being a bit speculative here, but uh, I, I suspect that the competition is something that has maybe um, uh, caused decentralization in, uh, in a number of cases. Yes, in your article, you write, states may want more when threatened by larger states, but unless competition lowers the cost of extraction, makes transfers more inefficient or increases the willingness of polities, of polities to give up more, then it may not cause centralization unless other foundations such as eye interaction capacity are in place first. Yeah, yeah. So I, I, that's sort of more or less a summary of, of, of what, um, yeah, what I just mentioned. Um, and just to reiterate it, so one of the arguments we make in the paper is that, is that the, the center itself, so the, the ruler the, themselves, they, they may not actually have a preference for centralization, especially if um, directly ruling is extremely expensive. So their preference may be for decentralized forms of rule because even though centralization would in theory bring more secure payments, it's so expensive to implement that it's not worth it. And unless that changes, well, competition it, competition doesn't really change those core preferences of, uh, of, of rulers. And the international competition Drives, cha drives change, but under what circumstances? Because you, you, you write, international competition is positively related to state centralization in high density systems. Yeah, so, so this, I think the, the broader point that, um, that is being made here is, is again, those circumstances under which competition like war basically might create centralized states the conditions under which that might happen are fairly narrow and and i think that's illustrated in our article where we explore just one or two reasons why but so um uh, the mechanism in the paper um describing situations under which competition might produce centralization, it, it goes something something like this. Um, um, it, it's that, so, so in higher density systems, um, what's likely to change is that the center's preference for centralized or decentralized forms of rule might change. So as uh, territories become more densely populated, uh, wealthier, uh, as as the ability to extend the infrastructure of rule uh, as those costs lower, the preference of of the center might change. It might change from, as I described before, more decentralized forms of rule to more centralized forms of rule. But that doesn't mean it immediately gets what it wants. Its preferences might have changed, but it doesn't mean it actually gets what it uh, what it wants because, of course, the periphery can still resist. Um, uh, resist those demands. So in the model, what competition does is it undermines the bargaining, the, the bargaining position of uh, the peripheral state, but only under really specific circumstances. And, and so, the, so the bargaining position of the peripheral state is in part determined by its ability to threaten independence, basically to fight for independence. And so the more valuable that independence is, the, the more kind of um, credible that threat is. But what competition does in the model is it undermines the credibility of that threat because as uh, the system becomes more competitive, well, 
states expect to survive, don't expect to survive as long in that system, which makes independence overall less valuable. So, so what's happening here is that the states, the center's preferences are changing and competition is undermining the bargaining position uh, of the peripheral polity. And those two things combined might mean that this peripheral state accepts demands for centralization. But I think the broader point is that this is a really, really specific set of circumstances. Um, and, and, and again, a little bit more, more broadly, um, it seems to me that it's only under conditions where competition would undermine rather than strengthen the bargaining position of, of uh, composites or, or parts of uh, decentralized states that we would we would expect this to drive centralization. Well, Charles Butcher, it was a pleasure reading your article and having you on as a guest has even been a bigger pleasure. But unfortunately for us, we have to wrap up. So I have to let you go. But thanks again for showing up. I, I really appreciate you taking the time to chat to me. Uh, it was it was fun. And um, I enjoyed also listening to your uh, your other your other shows on YouTube. So thanks very kindly. Listen Gavin. to the interview with Giacomo Benatti. He's a bit yep. critical of the argument that war makes states. Yeah, oh, we'll All do. Right. We'll do. Bye. Appreciate it. Thanks very much, Lipton.